right, I'm going to read this. Um, I'm going to read the question. And then I'm going to ask if the person who wrote the question is in the room so that I can get some clarification. Paul, or Shaul, said that breaking any law was breaking the whole law. Essentially, that God's standard is perfection. Jews today insist that God isn't an all or nothing God. Every obedience is worthwhile. Will you reconcile these views? If you wrote the question, are you in the room?
Um, maybe I should reserve this for another time. I'll leave it like <laughs> open. Uh, oh, we can have some discussion today on the issue, but uh, <laughs> so I'm not gonna like put it back and we won't discuss it. But uh, I, I really would like to get some clarification from whoever wrote the question to to be more specific in my answer because there are. Every person who puts a question here is wanting to know a specific thing. And so I, I don't want to just be generic. I want to actually uh, answer their question uh, the, the way they're desiring it to be answered. But yeah, you guys wanted to um, say something. I've read, I've read some little weekly partial studies, and I know I, that phrase came up in one where a young Jewish believer would <clears throat> ask the rabbi, well, you know, I failed in this way. I wasn't able to keep the Sabbath on this week. And the rabbi responded that, you know, that Yahweh or God is not an all or nothing God and that the mitzvah or what you can keep is, like, considered good. It's like, you, it's like don't give up or despair because you can't keep everything at all times. But to kind of, like, you need to just begin to attempting to and showing a willingness to follow his instructions and not to just say, well, I can't keep it all 100% of the time, so I'm just not even going to try it all. And he was just, I think, if, well, at least this reader, he was uh, encouraging them. But he did use that phrase that okay. God is not Good. Alone. Thank you. God. That, that brings some clarification to the issue. Um, I don't believe that there is a human being on the face of the planet that has ever lived in all of history, except Yeshua, that has kept every aspect of God's requirements and expectations perfect. And there's always situations where, um, you know, ext extenuating circumstances that interrupt our ability from time to time. And it's not an issue, really, of, um, and I agree with that rabbi, in that it's not an issue of, well, let me see if I can clarify it by giving an example. Um, well, we have, a we have a very clear mandate that on the Shabbat, we are to congregate, we're, have, we're to have a holy convocation on the Shabbat. But if you're stuck in the hospital, uh, you can't uphold that particular command of God to do. And it's not an issue of your being disobedient, you're not intentionally being disobedient against God. You have an extenuating circumstance that, that keeps you from being able to, to fulfill that uh, requirement uh, from God of, of being of gathering together, assembling together on the Shabbat, and so in that case, you know, God is looking at the heart of the individual. The Scripture says that He knows our thoughts and He knows the intents of our heart. He knows whether you're being intentionally disobedient or if you have circumstances that prohibit you from being able to fulfill. And so in that particular type of case, then yes, there are exceptions made for extenuating circumstances. The whole issue that Rob Shaul is bringing up, though, is specifically dealing with willful and rebellious disobedience against the commands of God. That's specifically what he's dealing with. And he's warning people, if you intentionally disobey God, if you intentionally disobey one of his requirements, then you are, are as guilty in that one thing as if you had been disobedient in every command of God. But again, isn't that like the hardness of your heart? Yes. And yes. you talk about the willingness. 
Many times he addressed uh, the leaders of that day because they were, or the, the people in the different uh, Messianic congregations that were coming out, and that they were trying to take the Gentiles back under and say, you have to follow, every, you have to do every commandment, every single thing in order to attain salvation. And he says, you couldn't do it. You know, because if you fail one, if you fail one, then you fail them all. It's the same as when Yeshua said, who is without sin, let him cast up her stone. And they all walked away. And as far as the standard of perfection, he's the only perfect one. The standard that he holds us to, I believe, are three things. Is, the, is that he wants us to love and to practice mercy in that he wants us to live a just life and that he wants us to be obedient. Those three things. And as far as as far as trying to keep the commandments, we're not in the Boy Scouts. We're not trying to get a merit badge for keeping the Sabbath right. We're not trying to get a merit badge for each of these little things, each of the 613 commandments. What we are trying to do is we are trying to pursue the commandments as best as he gives us the ability and the grace to do that and as best as we know how. We're not trying to attain them because to try and attain them would be to like bring God and put him in a box. And it's not like that. And as far as the, the Holy Convocation on Shabbat, personal opinion, that if I know somebody's in the hospital on Shabbat, then it's just as holy for me to go to them as it is to come here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. Sometimes when you're talking to people about the Word and stuff, they say, well, if God is love, and, you, know, you know, He'll forgive you for this and that. And they don't even want to try to walk in a... I look at the commandments more as instructions. If you eat meat and cheese together, you're going to have cardiac problems. You're going to have... Um, they, they call it... The cardiologists call it a heart attack in a sack, a cheeseburger. So, were the instructions to, for us to have a more prosperous, better life, uh, one that we wouldn't be hurting our parents, doing this and that, and robbing and doing all the different stuff? And if I looked at it like that, this is for my benefit to come here. When God commands you to worship Him, it's not for His benefit, it's for your benefit. You know, and you start looking at those things He tells you, is for our benefit to have a better life, to have a closer relationship with Him, to um, enjoy your, your time with Him, and looking forward to it. You know, I look forward to it. I mean, I can't hardly really wait till it gets here. Um. You're talking about Paul saying that, and maybe maybe there's other places that that particular scripture. Did they give a scripture there? Um, I found in James two, James two ten, uh, about keeping the whole law up in one point. On um, down from the tenth verse, it says in the twelfth verse, he says, "So speak ye and do ye, so that they shall be judged by the law of liberty." <coughs> And then in Galatians, Paul is talking about uh, justification. And if we, if we understand that we're not justified by our works, but by the faith that we have in the Lord's work, then I think that clarifies, to some degree anyway, uh, maybe a little deeper, you know, things that he was talking about there. Well, it's never, it's never been 
the, the, the commands of God, and, and actually, even though the scripture uses the word commands, um, like Robert is, was saying, uh, I actually prefer using the term instructions. Um, <coughs> the instructions of the Lord were never intended, according to the scripture, never intended to bring salvation to any people. Instead, they were a list of expectations of what the redeemed community was supposed to look like. <laughs> In other words, God is saying, if you are following me, if you are truly redeemed and you're pursuing me, this is what you're going to look like. This is what your life is going to look like. And like Nieva said, it's not about, well, I having a list and going, well, I did that one, check off. I did that one, check that one off. It, it, it's not about that at all. It's, it's about living before Him in such a way in relationship with Him, and it's always been about relationship from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, in, in such a way that all of that list of things that He's saying that He wants us to do, it, you, you just end up doing them automatically. Amen. Because of your re relationship with Him. It's not that you carry the list around and, and, and check it off when, when you do that thing or that thing. And unfortunately, um, both sides of the aisle, both in Judaism and Christianity, uh, it has become a list of, of things that you have to do in order to... to he, he described it as getting ba merit badges like in Boy Scouts. We've said many times, earning brownie points. Which is the same kind of same kind of idea, um, you know. Obviously, if you disobey, you're going to uh, incur the punishment of God. If you obey, you're going to incur the blessings of God. But um, you know, it's not. He just wants us to love Him. He always loves us, but He wants us to love Him back. And if we love Him the way that He wants us to love Him, we're going to do all of those things that He wants us to do. Because we love Him. <coughs> not because we have to. Not because He wrote down, you, you shall do this and you shall do that. But because we want to do that. Anyway, anything else? Questions? More comments? Okay. You got a comment? Okay. When you see in the Bible that he tells the man to love his wife, if it was natural, he wouldn't have commanded us to do it. When he tells her to obey her husband, it was natural. He wouldn't have had to command us. And those are suggestions to have a good relationship. So I, I, I really see that he's trying to give me a, a life abundant. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Boy, that's a pointed question. Um, since Hebrew is such an important language and a deeper understanding of the Bible can be gained from reading the original language, why are Hebrew classes not offered before service on Saturday? <laughs> We actually did that for a while, and it started off, like so many things, with a large group of people. And as each week went by, there were fewer and fewer and fewer people. And uh, some stuck in there all the way to the end, and I have to admit to you, um, my Knowledge of Hebrew is limited. I am not 
if I give you the impression that I'm fluent in Hebrew, uh, I'm not. And especially when it comes to grammar uh, and sentence structure and all those kinds of things, I can't, I can only go so far with, with my teaching. I can only give you like a beginner's understanding of, of Hebrew. Um, and then I reach the end of my personal knowledge. So that's, that's one part of it. Um, I really, really would love to have someone who is fluent in Hebrew available to me to be able to teach such lessons. I would like to learn more Hebrew, personally. Uh, but I don't know of anybody um, like that that is available to us. So, um, you know, if we can certainly get you started down the road, uh, if, you know, if you want to continue to learn more Hebrew, uh, beyond what we teach you, though, you're going to have to get like a software program or find someone else to pick up where we left off or, or whatever. Um, you get Rosetta Stone. Yeah, there's there are several different <laughs> there's several different uh, software programs that you can learn Hebrew from that are available. Anybody in the room currently ask that question? Okay. And um, so you would like to learn Hebrew then? Yes, because I'm trying to do it on my own, which is not the best way. Okay. Uh, well, we will, I, I think, have you, is this the first time that you've seen this announcement here? Um, the details of it, yes. Okay. Well, part of... Part of that is going to be beginning Hebrew. So if you can be involved in that, uh, you'll be able to begin getting some of the beginning Hebrew. So, okay. um, as far as having a class time before service, let me see, let me see uh, your hands. If that would be something that you would be not just interested in, but that you would actually commit yourself to, to come here prior to services to learn Hebrew. Yeah. Um, well, before we were doing it like, I think we were starting at like 1.30. You know, 1.30 to 2.30, we were doing an hour every week. Um, and really, that's not enough. I mean, you can't really learn a whole lot in an hour, one, once a week. Um, yes? May I ask you guys something? Sure. Okay, and this is something that the congregation probably needs to be taking to the Lord. Should we be actually be doing a class on Shabbat. And some people would say, well, it's a worship toward God, so therefore it's okay. And some people would say, well, it's, in my opinion, it's work. So there would be different opinions. We're going to have a day where we're going to be praying over stuff like this. So I suggest that on that one, we pray whether or not we're actually supposed to do a class on Shabbat. That's a just nice set about Rosetta Stone. It comes in three different stages. What if we put in our resources? Because uh, that's if you go have somebody, it's like $10 an hour. But if everybody that was interested in that, we put in enough to buy the first session, and then let them meet and go through those that beginner session or something like that. And we keep uh, doing that and keep putting in 10 bucks until we buy the second set. Eventually, you have the whole program. Uh, it would be uh, something that you could uh, do whenever you do it. 
but it, uh, it's a pretty good program. They really give you conversational so that we could actually converse with each other and say things. Um, I think it's possible to, to see how much interest we have and then go towards something like that. I wholeheartedly agree with the whole concept of the advantage of knowing Hebrew in studying the scripture. It will, if you know Hebrew, even beginning Hebrew, and you can start um, looking into the meanings of words in particular passages, it will open your <coughs> eyes to things that you didn't know were there. Um, and you'll begin to get a different understanding and perspective on certain scriptural passages that have been mistranslated, mm -hmm. uh, misapplied, uh, mis uh, teachings that have in, uh, errant teachings that have been based upon an, an improper translation and application of a particular passage. It will clarify for you some things that um, you may have been scratching your head about for um, all your life if you grew up in like a church background. Um, there's one one particular verse that I like to bring up that's um, I like to bring it up because it is quoted quite often in uh, Christian circles um, and that is the, the passage that has been translated when the enemy comes in like a flood God will raise a standard against him Okay. Well, if you actually take a look at that passage in the original text, it doesn't say anything like that. It says it, it is a passage that's talking about the Ruach HaKodesh rushing in like a flood, not the enemy. And it doesn't say anything about God raising a standard against anything. And that has been misquoted because it's in our translation of the Bible that has been misquoted in teachings created over decades based on that misquotation of a mistranslation of a passage. And that, that you'd be surprised at how many such passages there are. To say that Christ um, fulfilled the law. Yeah. <coughs> so anyway, it is important. I agree with you. It's very important. Yes. There is a book that it has Hebrew words and pictures, and I don't know who it's by, but you can get it at the store that would help also. Oh, with learning Hebrew? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> I didn't raise my hand when you asked because of the fact that I'm we're not here completely. But in Georgetown, uh, Lori opened up the house who never wanted to learn Hebrew. And she started out with the Aleph Bet, and then they went on to taking Psalms, the Psalm for the Week, and they'd go through it and learn the punctuation and all that kind of stuff. And as soon as she got the punctuation, I went, <laughs> so, But anyway, I know that she would love to do that. Not that she's fluent in it, but that, but that she's very committed to it. And, and it started out with a pretty good number and then... Okay. Yeah. 